So the Book of Acts gives us the model for reaching the ends of the earth. So I'm in Burma right now. The island of Bali is absolutely spectacular. We are in Cambodia here. This is a beautiful family that lives in a village that we've done distributions with. In the Great Commission, let's remember, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. And for us at World Mission, it's really important that the Word of God be a part of that. I mean, how can you really become a disciple if you don't have access to the Word of God? We are in Kor, the middle of Rendili land, and all these brothers are Rendili pastors. So are you guys happy about these units? Yes. yes. All right. Cambodia is a, an amazing country. It's surrounded by Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand. And the 16 million people that live here, they say about 85% are Buddhists, and many of them have never heard the gospel for the first time. Hello and welcome. This is the Great Commission Update. I'm Rusty Humphreys. He is Greg Kelly. He is the CEO of World Mission. And uh, Greg, you're back from another adventure. I am. I am. Where, where'd you go this time? Oh, I had a great time, Rusty. I was in Kenya, where we've got a long-standing work, over 20 years of uh, work there in northern Kenya. And then I was in Ethiopia. I uh, have not been there too many times, so that was nice. It was in Addis Ababa. Oh, it's always a fun uh, city. Addis Ababa, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Addis Ababa. And then also uh, spent about a week in Egypt. So that is a place, Rusty, that uh, we view as an incredibly strategic country. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, but we spent a week there, and, and boy, the Lord is really yeah. opening up some great doors. Did you have any troubles there? Because I'll tell you what, the only time I was ever arrested, held, <laughs> uh, they took my passport, they called me a spy, and they oh, threatened cool. to put me in prison, and it was because yep. I took a picture of the sign, Welcome to Egypt, Yikes. Um, and I had uh, recording equipment. Did yeah. you have problems there, too, or was that it just, I was just lucky? It's interesting that you asked that question because the last world mission uh, personnel that went there was just over a year ago, and they were detained for 24 hours okay. in a cell and not allowed into the country. And so they I weren't was, allowed in the country. They never were allowed in. They were, you know, we have our solar powered audio Bibles, and we, he had some with him in his luggage, and customs officials didn't like that. And uh, they ended up holding him and uh, and then they never let him into the country. So, you know, it's it's just it's one of those difficult, uh, delicate countries that when you're going through customs and immigrations, um, it's it just they're they're aware. I'll just say it like that. Uh, of, well, I uh, guess it's better to not be allowed in the country than not be allowed out, yeah, which is where right. I was. And it was so funny because I'll never forget as we were going in, this was during the um, Arab Spring a few okay. years ago. And the guy at the border is going, hey, come on in. Uh, riots everywhere. He was like joking about it. Yeah. And yeah. then like, man, when I came back, they they were not nice. No, it's interesting because the, the, that's, of course, where the Muslim Brotherhood, the origin of that. And so we were going through you know, downtown Cairo and they were pointing out, yeah, that's Muslim Brotherhood area. That is. And we're kind of like, they're like, oh, no, no, no. They've got it kind of under control. Uh, they've definitely. I mean, when when you're a country like that and you're so dependent on tourism, you don't want things like the Muslim Brotherhood going on that are just scaring people away when you've got these random attacks and targeting uh, things that are religious in nature. So I think they've really kind of clamped down on that. But at the same time, you, you just have to be careful. I mean, anytime you're in a country that size, 100 million people, and there's an element of radical Islam, um, you just have to be aware. You have to be conscientious of your surroundings uh, and you know the people that you're with. Uh, where you're going to just our our philosophy is let's keep a low profile uh, working with the nationals we don't need to make megaphone announcements we're here not preaching jesus on the street corner in our, in our model but you just got to be smart you just got to be yeah. smart I, I mean i think that that would be um a pretty serious thing i mean it's not a that's not a place where they're where you're very welcome i would think no i mean it's so again 100 million it's the third most populated country in the entire continent of Africa. Wow. It's about 85% Muslim. Um, and the, the Christian, it's a little skewed, actually. The, the Christian percentage is, you know, in that 15% neighborhood. That's the rest of them, roughly. But it's very heavy Orthodox. So when we're talking about Christian countries, a lot of times, 
you know, it's it's the whole melting pot of Christianity. You know, it's Orthodox, it's Catholics, it's, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, it's everybody kind of gets thrown in there. There's very few what we'd refer to as evangelicals uh, in in it's like less than five percent. So it's a big minority. And all of the churches, I mean, imagine this, Rusty, when we went to church on Sunday, which, of course, that's the day that we all would worship. Right. right. Sunday in Egypt is just a regular day. It's like it's like our Monday here because it's such an Islamic country. The majority that Sunday is not observed uh, as uh, as the Sabbath uh, in Islamic culture. So it's more Friday and Saturday. So Sunday is the beginning of the week. Mm. So super busy. It's active. And so the Christians, generally speaking, you know, they're working on Sunday. So church is on Sunday night. So our church are at about 9 p.m. So it's just things to get used to when you're in a place like that. That's actually kind of cool, though. It's just it's yeah. different and you're you're following along with their culture and and yeah. uh, that that's good. Yeah. Um. So like it's, it, your your trip. So you, you did Egypt and yep. you went some other places. It was was this a hard journey for you? Well, um, I think coming to a place like Egypt and you've got this idea of how are we going to utilize this very strategic location to impact? It's not just about Egypt and probably Rusty, it stands out more so than any other place we work around the world. All right. From Senegal and West Africa, all the way to Indonesia, 9,000 miles. This location is just very different. And here's why Egypt, it's, it's not only about the hundred million people that are in Egypt, but it is, I'm telling you, the most influential country in all of North Africa, the most influential country, arguably, in the entire Middle East and even the Arab Peninsula. So you've got 19 countries that would make up what we would call Arab nations. If you start in Mauritania to the far um, western part of, of North Africa and then go all the way over to Iran. OK, there's 19 countries, North Africa, Middle East and the Arab Peninsula and Egypt is the most strategic of all of them. So all of our ministry sort of um, is, is, comes out of Egypt. It goes to North Africa, to the West, and then into the Middle East. Uh, so you, you know, you're talking about countries like Lebanon, Syria, which borders Iraq, which borders Iran. All of it originates from Egypt. So from that standpoint, it's really exciting. It's very strategic, but it's beautiful because Arab uh, Arabic is the glue. All of those countries, um, with the exception of, of, of Iran, is going to speak heavily Arabic. Okay. So you can get away. Normally, when we're in a country, um, a, the border country, like, for example, Kenya, Swahili. So Ki Swahili is the main language. You go up to the border to the north, Ethiopia, and it's Amharic. So you might find a few Swahili speakers, but Amharic is the major language. You go over to Somalia, it's Somali. Um, you go to Uganda, it's Luganda. You know, so every country kind of has its own language. But when you're talking about the Arab world, it's all Arabic. So it makes it very nice uh, when you're doing ministry, whether you're doing distributions in Tunisia or you're doing distributions in Lebanon or you're doing distributions in, um, you know, in Egypt. It's Arabic. That's the language that's, that, that they will be using. Uh, you don't speak Arabic at all, do you? Or do you <laughs> have you worked on that or tried? Well, here's the truth. Yeah. In, uh, in my 22 years as a CEO of World Mission, I've, you know, I've, I've been in you know, Rwanda. I've been in uh, Bosnia. I've been in China. And I, you know, a new, another language is like, eh, if there is a language that I would love to learn, it's Arabic. But it's a I, tough I, one. It's a tough one. You got to kind of dig deep and you're kind of doing the, <laughs> sounds like you, it looks like you're spitting on people all the time when you're, when you're talking. If Stop you do it that. Right. Yeah. But it's a beautiful language. That's wow. for sure. People are precious. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you learned. Um, and we've got some pictures here we want to show yeah. folks. Let's, uh, um, you know, tell me a little bit about your trip. All right. Good deal. That's to, let, so uh, the first picture that we're looking at here, um, what do you got up there? Nothing. I'm waiting for you to tell me. You can start the well, slideshow and I'll just run. Oh, man. Well, let's just throw the little video in there. I did a little video. So I was uh, in this place called Dump City. All right. How's that? How'd you like Dump to say? City. <laughs> here we come. You, no. Where are you from, Rusty? I'm from <laughs> Dump City. It's literally one of the largest trash landfills, dump, whatever you want to call it, in uh, the entire continent of Africa. So it's been there for decades. 
And what happened is that um, the people that are in the rural areas, uh, irregardless of where you're at in Africa, uh, there's a, a draw, a magnetic pull, if you will, to the cities because of opportunity. So you'll find the, the right. most impoverished people will try to come to the cities. And a lot of times they're just not finding opportunities. So they end up in a place like this, which is called, you know, again, dump city. So um, here we are uh, with this video that, uh, that that describes a little bit of that, some of the background on it. And uh, we can pick it up afterwards. All right, so here we are in Cairo again the largest city in the entire continent of Africa, 20 million people here. And like most places in Africa where there's large cities, people in rural areas, the impoverished people, the poorest of the poor, the uneducated, the illiterate, are attracted to the opportunities that the urban environment uh, provides, which Cairo is that. So people from an area called Upper Egypt, which is about five, uh, five hours away, just gravitated here uh, over 30 years ago. Uh, and they were drawn to the city for opportunity, uh, but they found none. And the only opportunity for them was to collect garbage. And so what happened, a small group of people began to congregate in this dump right here, uh, as I said, over 30 years ago, which turned into an entire community of tens and tens of thousands of people now living inside of this dump where they're making their homes out of people's trash and they were gathered here and the church began to take interest uh, and these people began to get reached uh, and many of them coming to know Christ. The result of it, which was nothing over 30 years ago, now they built literally a church in the rocks. Uh, it's an open cave, basically. It's the largest open area church in all of the Middle East now that started from a trash pit from these people who now have a hunger for Christ. World Mission is trying to help reach this area with our solar powered audio Bibles because these people remain the poorest of the poor, uh, but yet there's a hunger for the gospel. And so these illiterate people are coming to know Christ and really forming a wonderful church. So be praying for Cairo, be praying for Egypt and the people who are living here in Dump City. It's trash, it Russ, yeah. everywhere, yeah. everywhere, it's trash. And you know, I, I mean, the idea that that was a landfill, that they built the city on top of the landfill and now you've got literally these hundreds of thousands of people that are there, poorest of the poor, all kinds of backgrounds, ethnicities that are gravitating there. And they've, I mean, there's shops there. There's everything that you would expect, mm -hmm. but everywhere you look, it's like the signs of trash. Right. Oh, so, you know, a lot of them, their job is they will find plastics and they'll re, they have recycling, like almost like plants right, right on the, the streets. Um, I mean, in a lot of places where there's poverty, and I, and I forget there's some kind of a, a formula or something I, I've read someplace, but when you're poor, <laughs> the last thing you care about is trash, right? It's just, it's yeah. everywhere, and you just throw it in the backyard, and that's just the way it is. What yeah, sanitation is not an issue to you. I mean, yeah. you're, what you and I would go, Ugh, you know, throw, I mean, they, they just throw trash right right in front of anybody down on the ground, have no regard for it. Not, not and so you've seen that in places like Cambodia, like I have and other places. Why right. is it different or worse here? Or is it just the same wherever poverty is? Well, I mean, it's always disturbing when you see that and you feel bad for the people. I think it's the sheer volume of people in this case in Cairo and realizing that that is their only opportunity. Um, so on one hand, you're looking at that and you're, and you're just overwhelmed with, the, the wrench of it, the stink of it, and thinking this is the life of these, um, you know, men, women, uh, boys, girls for the rest of their life. But then, you know, you don't see, that's all they know. So it's not like they're sitting there complaining, oh, I wish I had this or that, because they don't know anything differently. So, uh, you know, in some ways you're, you're kind of attracted a little bit to their, their, their sense of, um, you know, I'm at peace uh, because of, of their contentment, you know, which of course we lack here. Uh, in large measure, but uh, that that's something that you're drawn to. But at the end of the day, Rusty, it's always about, hey, where is the the gospel witness that's going on here? And there is some church activity that's been going on. You saw that, that because of their poverty, let me just point this out, that church, they, they, they couldn't really afford to build anything. And as the people are coming to know the Lord, they literally dug the rock out of this, this you know, wall of rock. It's actually would. a pretty cool looking church, actually. The largest open air church in the Middle East. I mean, it's wow. massive. It's just shocking how big it is, but it's right tied into this dump. 
I mean, that, that whole thing is not some tourist attraction that's, you know, over by the pyramids. Yeah. This is actually right connected. You have to drive through the dump to get to this open air church wow. in the cave. It's just. It's, How it's, far it's, were you from the pyramids? How far is that from the pyramids? I know a lot of people have been there. Yeah, the pyramids are actually a part of Cairo. They're on the other side, but to, it's like a major city, I guess. You know, Chicago, New York, probably something like that. To go from one end of the city to the other, it could be a couple hours or something. But the, the pyramids are definitely a part of Cairo. Right. Uh, so you didn't go there this time? Just check it out? We're, we were over there. We were yeah. over there. We nice. uh, I, I had a couple of guys with me from one of our uh, supporting churches, and they they wanted to, to go over there and see it. And that, that never never gets old. I mean, you, okay. you cannot not go there and just be humble. You go it. inside them? You can, yeah. you can. If you have claustrophobia, not a great idea. No, okay. But uh, there are people that go in there. There's not much to it. There's kind of a big room, the uh, the king's room and the queen's room, and you don't you don't get to go around too much. But it's uh, it's an interesting experience for sure. Very so cool. now, did you get there? Now you've got a picture of a bus here. Did you get there yeah. on this bus? Yeah, you know what's fun about that bus is the back of it. You'll see. Uh, we've told the story so many times to people. Uh, you know, different ways. It's, it goes to the the idea of how do you reach people in a mm-hmm. place like Cairo? And you can't open air, just go up and evangelize and share with them. So we have this thing called a light stream that creates an invisible signal. It appears on your phone as uh, a Wi-Fi setting would. And so on those buses on the back, you'll see it says Wi-Fi. So they, yeah. they all advertise, hey, if you ride my bus, public transport, you get Wi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, but when you get on there, they, none of them work. <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> kidding. None of them work. And so when our guys are on these buses, though, they have a light stream in their backpack that's transmitting what would appear to be an Internet signal. So when people get on the bus, they look for their Wi-Fi. And if our guys are on the bus, they'll pick it up. Uh, but it's the Jesus film. It's God's story. It's the word of God. And so it's, they, they they just love that because they'll just ride around on the bus uh, for a couple hours and watch people just boom. You know, start watching the Jesus film in Arabic, and that's a pretty cool. That's a pretty cool encounter. Oh, that's uh, funny. So, that's yeah, funny. Yeah. Uh, let's go back. There's a picture here uh, back of Dump City. Uh, just uh, some huge uh, piles of. Yeah, those are the recycle. So they'll they'll grab the the plastics and they'll put them in there. But I mean, I just want you to to process that, that a little bit. So imagine your home is right next to that. So every day you walk out, and boom, you just see these piles of you know, recycled plastics and trash and the stench of it all. Those are everywhere, Rusty. I could have taken a hundred photos of what people are just collecting and they're going, you know, in the middle of the landfill, they're grabbing this stuff and they're bringing it back and they're trying to make a buck on it. But that, that is just a, every single street that you turn down. That's the visuals that you see. And then uh, we've got some uh, picture of some food here. Uh, this is what you're yeah. eating there, huh? It you looks know, like I'm pretty good well, eating. It is really good eating. You could say this about uh, Lebanon and Egypt. Uh, of all the places that we do ministry uh, around the world, I, I really the best food is in this part, in my opinion. So you've got people who like hummus, uh, people who like kind of pita bread. This is the place for you. They've got yeah. something called shawarma, where they cut kind of lamb off, and so you're not you're Chicken not or beef, yeah. when you're in Egypt. That's for sure. Yeah, Lots it's of, the same thing. If you go to Israel, that's the same kind of food we'd have too. Did they, in Israel, did they eat their main meal like at 3 or 4 p.m.? It's crazy how they do that. Like you're, they don't eat a normal kind of morning breakfast. They have a huge breakfast in Israel, huge, giant. And then, and by, and by the way, could they have more sugar? (laughs) Help me out, huh? Help me out. They like a lot of sugar and a lot of baked goods. There you go. It's a lot of meat. It's a lot of meat in Egypt and they they eat their main meal at like 4 p.m. Really? And they will eat stuff. And then they have another one at like 9 or 10 p.m. So it's, it's, and everybody does it. It's just, I tell them like, this is like the worst uh, eating patterns that you can imagine. <laughs> I mean, going to bed, but they're like, oh no, that's how we do it. Like, okay. Oh, that's funny. Uh, let's see. And then uh, there's a Muslim training center here. What is this? Yeah. So one of the things uh, that's going on in, in Egypt, because it's such a strategic culture center, Uh, And with it being a majority Muslim country, they're very aggressive and active in raising up what we would think of as missionaries. So everybody who graduates from this university has the same degree. It's basically a an Islamic studies kind of missionary degree. And they're they're sending people out to the tune of about twenty four thousand graduates every year. And the the students are coming from over one hundred countries. So they're coming there. They're learning about Sharia law. 
many of them become imams and they're just launching them out and it's state subsidized. So the taxpayers in Egypt are paying for this. Can you imagine in America, if, if you mandated your tax dollars, were going to say, you know, Christian education of, of people, um, you know, becoming missionaries and being sent them out. And so Somebody yelling, you're breaking the law, yeah, breaking the law, yeah. separate church and state, everything else, you yeah. know, so. It's just the, the Christians there. It's, it's really a frustrating issue for them because they see, um, you know, how aggressively they are. The government is resourcing these missionaries that are going. You know, a lot of them are coming to America, Rusty. They're coming mm-hmm. to Mexico, Canada, coming to all the Western countries, all throughout Africa, Asia, and it's just very. I think it's just a reminder. They're very aggressive yeah. at sending out and uh, raising up leaders. And there really is, you know, we talk about separation of church and state, which, by the way, if you go back and read that letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist. It wasn't about separation of church and state, but that's a different story. But in the Quran, there is no separation of church and state. In the Quran, it tells you how you run your government, what kind of money you print up, blah, 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 right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's it's such an, the Quran is so, um, you know, aggressive against any other religion. They'll say there's freedom of religion, but once you become a Muslim, um, if you were to convert to Christianity, there is a series of what we would call persecutions. I mean, in a number of instances, they, they'll kill you. Yeah. You absolutely. convert, but otherwise they'll do things like report you to the police and the police will put pressure on you. Maybe put, Hey, we're going to put you in jail for you know three nights and make you think about it. Hey, this whole idea of you becoming a Christian now is not a good idea. And then, you know, the, the, the family really is the it's the one who's exerting the most pressure on you. I mean, that threatened to cut you off from everything. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, they'll talk, they'll call your employer and say, this person says they're a Christian now. You know, you need to fire them. Uh, and the, the pressure of the community, the employer fires them. So there's just a lot of things that are going on. But if, if the roles are reversed, if you're a Christian and you want to convert to Islam, oh, that's fine. No problem at all. I mean, they'll welcome you in. Um, but if you were to think of leaving Islam, they make it incredibly difficult for you. Um, but we need to do it. Yep. We need to do it. So this was a overall successful journey to Egypt. And I'm sure in other shows, we're going to talk about some of your other uh, parts of this trip, right? So yeah, we'll get to Ethiopia next time, probably. Okay. But yeah, Egypt, for the reasons I stated, Rusty, it's such a strategic location for these 19 Arab uh, nations, the, the whole world mission uh, ministry kind of originates from there. It launches out from there and it's touching. I mean, there's 300 million people uh, when you start looking at these countries and most of them are without their first gospel witness. Wow. So to us, you know, you're talking even just Western. Let me just give one example. Western yeah. Sahara, 600,000 people. It's the it's a country in the far Western part of North Africa. And you've got 10 tribes there. It's considered 100 percent Muslim. This country, Western Sahara, 100% Muslim. So we have to have initiatives to get into these very difficult, complicated areas. And Egypt is the key to it, because if you're connected with Egypt, you have an Arabic sort of you know, launching pad, if you will, you, you have access now to these places. So we're wow. excited. Wow. All right. Well, I'm excited about a trip you and I are going to go on in the next yeah. month or so. I've been uh, working out, uh, right. hiking like- a lot. Yeah, you look awesome. I don't, look- don't, I don't know if you can tell yet, but I'm oh, yeah, I'm getting there. Yeah. Uh, I looked up the Pooh Trail, which is what one of the things we're walking on. And okay. that's a five-day hike each way. Is that what we're doing? Oh, we, we can do it in two and a half. We'll cut that baby right in half. You, you will we'll be fine. No, it's actually Poon Hill. Poon Hill. That's, that's the location. Okay, Poon so Hill. It's, it's part of the Annapurna Range. Okay which is Bring opposite Mount Everest. Yep, write that down. So we're going to see yeah. Mount Everest. We're not going up Mount Everest this time. Correct, correct. Okay. The Annapurna Range is still, I mean, we're talking peaks in every direction, over 25,000 feet. I mean, it's, it's massive, this range. too. It's all the Himalaya Mountains. Right. Uh, so are we getting up to 20,000 feet? Not quite. We're not quite going to get that. Like how we'll, high, you think? We'll get, we'll get over 12,000 feet. I mean, I, you know, I, but you've been I'll gone for a month, and this is all I've been working on pretty much other than my <laughs> job and this trip, okay? You have there no you idea how much I've been working on this. And I'll and work. I thought we were hitting 20,000. 12,000 is better. But to put it in perspective, at 10,000 feet, that's when they turn the Wi-Fi on on your airplane. There you okay? go. Okay? So that's, that's, when, that's when they say, okay, you can unbuckle your belt and, you, you know, right. walk around the cabin. And we're going 12,000. We're going, we're above that, buddy. We are above that. Yes. Yes. Do we need oxygen? 
Um, you know, we'll only be up there at that level for less than a day, and then we'll start to descend, come down. So we'll just we'll, what happens is you get into Kathmandu, mm-hmm. and you're already at several thousand feet, and then you're you know you're doing the hiking, so your your body's getting acclimated, and then you kind of gradually get up to to that point. You know, when they when they climb Everest, it's interesting. People people you know hear about they go to Lukla, which is the most dangerous airport in the world. We're not going there, and then from Lukla you go to base camp. And so they go to base camp and then they stare there a little while. And then you, we hear of camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four, right? So all these right. things. But what most people don't realize is that the climbers, they'll go up to base camp and then camp one and then back down to base camp. Why? And they'll camp one, camp two, back down to base camp. They're acclimating their body. If you tried to go fly to Kathmandu, go to Lukla, and then summit Everest the next day, you'd like, you'd die. You just, you just wouldn't be able to do it because your body would not be acclimated to the lack of oxygen at those high levels. So that climbers will constantly go up and down, up and down uh, as they're getting ready to summit Everest. So is that what we're, we're not doing that? We're not doing that. We're not summiting Everest now. No. Okay. And, <laughs> and how many miles a day do you think we're hiking on oh, that big hike? Well, we're probably going to be in the neighborhood of five miles a day, five, 10 miles. But the thing is, it's the elevation. Okay. Hold on a second. Did you hear how he did that? Eh, five or 10. <laughs> We're going to go either two or a hundred miles. One of the two. We're not quite sure. You just doubled it on me right there. Did I? Boy, that was five or uh, 10. Yeah, 10 or 20. I can't slip anything past you. Um, Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's, the elevation is the thing. You're going to be just fine. You're going to be just fine. We've got people. You could tell people you had Sherpas, legitimate Sherpas who are carrying your stuff. What's a Sherpa? Those are the the guys who who are carrying all your things. Oh. So you you yeah you know you we'll have our nice little boots and kind of you know gear on and that kind of things. These Sherpas are going to have like sandals on and they're going to be carrying you know twice the weight of their their body on their back, uh, walking past you like mountain goats. Okay, and now here okay I got a couple. First of all, how much is that guy going to cost? Wow, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay, we'll we're going to figure that. Okay, here's the and here's another one. I got to go get a sleeping bag. Do I get one that's for under a zero degrees? 30 degrees, 50 degrees. I have no idea what the temperature is going to be in March. You know, I think, I think just get to go middle range. That's, that's my philosophy. I, n- I don't want the, you know, the, the one with the highest number or I don't want the one with the lowest number. So just go the one right in the middle. So whatever, whatever that So you think is. 50 degrees is okay in March in yeah, for sure. by Mount yeah. Everest. Yeah. You know, the thing is, that's kind of cool is one of these little houses, things that we're staying at along the way, they've got these uh, big, heavy wool blankets too. And so you'll be able to chuck one of those on you if, if you get a little chilly. So you'll be okay. good. All right. Good. And then electricity. I did get a solar powered uh, uh, charger. Okay. You'll be good. Okay. Is there, because there's not electricity in those places, is there? It's hit and miss. Uh-huh. It's hit and miss. So sometimes, you know, we might, uh, luck of the draw, we might get in a spot that they, they were very, uh, you know, visionary and they had uh, a source of electricity, but we can't guarantee that. Or is it one of those places where they have big signs that says electricity and Wi-Fi and neither one of them are there? I, well, that could be. <laughs> you will, I promise you, you'll get Wi-Fi in places you least suspected it. That's for sure. Really? It's all, yeah, it's yeah. all fascinating. And, and, you know, I'm not really that worried about it. I just want you guys to who are listening to kind of yes. kind of go through the, the, the planning that I'm going through and I, I've literally been hiking almost every single day. Uh, we have mountains here in Arizona. I'm doing that. I got the the uh, walking poles, which I never thought of before. And you, that's on oh. our list. Those really make a difference. Yeah, you're way ahead of me, buddy. So I mean, anything you've done, just just tell yourself in your head, I'm, I'm out. I'm out. Uh, you know, I'm beating Greg. I'm, I'm Greg's not doing this. So that'll make you feel better. That does make me feel much, much better. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, All right. One thing we need from you, though, is to help us out. We are going here and we're going to bring the treasure, uh, the solar powered Bible. Do you have one of those there, Greg? Um, I do. Uh, I do. And this do. is the the foundation of the ministry. Would you, is that a good way to put that? Yeah, there's no doubt. Well, I mean, 45, 50,000 of these every year, these solar powered audio Bibles in the language of the people. So we'll be taking when we go on this trip, uh, of course, we'll be in Bangladesh before, which we haven't talked a lot about. Uh, the Rohingya refugees will be taking a whole bunch of Rohingya treasures, some Nepali treasures. Uh, and, and the Rohingyas, uh, they're having a really tough time. So this is going to be, a, 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 I'm guessing, heartbreaking to get in there. It will be. We have three medical doctors that are going with us on our trip. So they are going to be ministering physically to these people, encouraging them. 
And uh, we'll be distributing probably a couple hundred treasures just there. And then a couple hundred more when we get to Nepal. So, I mean, the people in the in the places we're going to are so it's such a rural area off the grid. Most of the people are not literate. And so these treasures are just life transforming. All right. So if you would, please, uh, we really could use your help to get these treasures to the hands of these people that have never heard the word of God, never heard the word Jesus before. I mean, you know, again, I that's that's what I have a hard time wrapping my head around. Yeah, you know, know, come on, never, not even one, one time you never heard Jesus, never. So here's how you can help. Again, by donating to World Mission, worldmission.cc, you can help. $40 gets one of those, just one, into the hands of uh, a, a new believer. And one of those believers tends to have, what, 10, 15 people that listen to that one treasure, right, Greg? Yeah, I mean, each listening group, Rusty, is probably around 12 people. And uh, when the people get the units, they're really trained to leverage it and maximize it. So they're multiplying themselves by setting up a listening groups, um, really a, a new listening group almost every week for sure, every month. And so you have uh, way over 100 people that are uh, encountering the gospel for the first time in their life because of a single treasure, 40 bucks. I mean, it's just a crazy thought, but that you and I will have the privilege of delivering them. And then, of course, reporting back to our, our listeners uh, and our viewers here on the Great Commission update, and just letting them know that I mean they're with us, Rusty. I mean yeah. that's the reality of it. I mean they will be with us uh, as we are distributing uh, the treasures. So it's pretty exciting. And the other thing, if you donate some money and uh, and let us know, I'll try to if it's a business or something, I'll try yeah. to say it while we're there. Uh, maybe we'll put you on the show and and just say hi to you and and acknowledge uh, your your kind uh, generosity. So we'd sure appreciate it. again. Worldmission.cc is where you can go online and do that. Worldmission.cc. Greg, you want to wrap this up for us? Yeah, we appreciate everybody who watches the Great Commission update. And encourage you to just share it with your friends and family. Um, you know, and the thing that Rusty and I are just really trying to convey to you is these places, whether we're talking about Bangladesh, where we're talking about Egypt, where we're talking about Nepal, where we'll be going, um, you know, not all of us will ever have the opportunity to go there, but the gospel needs to go. So as we have the privilege of taking it there, just know how much you appreciate it as you pray for us, as you help us send treasures there. Uh, it's, it takes all of us. The Great Commission, Jesus' last words, no individual, no church, no single organization is going to get it done. It takes all of us together. Well, we sure appreciate you. He's Greg Kelly, CEO of World Mission. I'm Rusty Humphries, worldmission.cc, and we'll catch you next time here on the Great Commission Update.